So I've been sad recently and sometimes suicidal thoughts come in my head. And I know taking God's gift of life and just take it away is a major sin. Although everyone sins and God forgives, is there a certain point where God does not forgive if you take your own life? Wow. I appreciate you coming in and, and being honest with us. Yeah, I really do. And I, I can tell you're, you're struggling right now. You're wrestling with some, some hard stuff. I, I understand that. It's hard, given everything you said, to treat this in a purely clinical manner, right? It's hard to sit down and just go, well, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the theology says, blah, 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 blah. I don't think I can do that, given your situation, right? I, I'd like to set you up for success so that you can move past this, right? Move beyond this going forward. That's what I would like to do. But it's extremely complicated, right? And a random a random guy on the internet through text chat and a microphone, it's going to be really unlikely that I can help you to work through anything. Even if I spent the rest of the stream trying to work through the these ideas with you, it's extremely unlikely that that's possible. This is super difficult. So, I, I don't know that I have... I don't know that I have the tool set either at this point to help somebody to work through this. Let, let me let me say this, okay? I'm just going to pop off. I'm just going to run my mouth for a little bit. And if you find any of this helpful, go ahead and uh, take it. And if you find any of it unhelpful, throw it away, okay? So I'm just going to run my mouth for a little bit. I've struggled with things like this before. I, I can't say I know what you're feeling or know what you're going through, but I've had I've had thoughts like that before. And I want you to know it's not forever. In those moments, it feels like it can be forever. It feels like there is no hope. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. It feels like it's never going to change. It's never going to end. This pit that you're in, this darkness that you have found yourself to be in, will never transform. And it feels like there's no hope and that that's the only hope for escape. It feels like you can't get out. And I want you to know that in the in those moments when you feel that way, it truly feels like that's the case. It feels like that's the reality of the situation. But it's not. It's not the reality of the situation. And looking back at those times in my life, thinking through some of those thoughts and those ideas, where I'm at now, it seems crazy. Like, wow, to have been in a place like that, right? And, and so here's my first point. Now, now, you don't get to dictate what part of the storm you're in. You don't get to dictate where the end of the valley is. You don't get to decide just for yourself, snap your fingers and pull yourself out of it. You don't get to say like, oh, I'm going to be better now. That's not how any of this works. And that's part of why it's so, such a struggle and so frustrating. But I promise there is a different reality for you. And if you can make it to that different reality, everything is different there. Things have changed there, you know? And so that's something I, I would like to throw out there. Hope. There is hope. I know there is. Our realities change. Our circumstances change all the time. Year to year. Month to month. Week to week. Things change and they can change in radical ways that are completely beyond your comprehension. So that you're not even able to understand how they have adjusted or changed in that way. You know, so that's, that's one thing I want to say. There is hope, even if you can't see it, there is a different reality, even if it doesn't look like there is one or feels like there is one. Okay. So that's one thing. The next thing I would like to bring up, and again, I feel wo woefully inadequate to address this issue. So like I said, if any of this you find helpful, take it. And if you don't find any of it helpful, throw it away. But 
The next thing is almost everyone who struggles with depression finds some relief in community, friends, family, support, other people, just being around them, even if you're not feeling it. Taking time, spending time with others. The limited studies that I have read on this show that the more you can involve yourself and invest yourself in others, the less dark the pit seems to be. And so oftentimes, oftentimes the result of depression is to retract, to pull away. Why? Because your thought process roughly goes like this. I'm a burden to everyone. I'm useless to everybody. The world would be better off without me. I hate my life. I don't want to live anymore. And you get stuck in this cycle and you just retract, you retract, you retract, right? And so you will turn down social events because you don't want to be a burden. You won't interact or engage with friends or family because you think that they don't want to see you. They don't want to be around you. They don't want to be with you. That's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. So number one, I want you to know there's hope. There's a different reality. You just don't get to determine when that different reality is manifested. The second thing I want you to know is community, friends, family, church, others. Spend time with others. Invest in others. Please, please make an extended effort to do that. To reach out and spend time with people you love or that love you. And if you don't have many friends or family to rely upon, make some. Get involved in a community. Go to a church local congregation where you can get active and involved in other people's lives. Uh, final thing. And that, this will this will go to the theo theological aspect of the question you asked. I I think it's quite clear in the Bible that God loves us and he wants the best for us. And I've lived that reality in my life. And the best for us is to embrace the life he has given us. And to wrestle with it and work through it to the best of our abilities so that we can honor, love, and glorify him as much as we can with our lives. And... He often brings many of us through difficult trials and hard times that others don't have to experience. Why? Why? I think this is important. This is a theory I have. I don't have an explicit Bible verse, but this is a theory I have on this topic. I've been preaching through Ecclesiastes, so I've been thinking about this quite a bit. There's one subset of people in the world who are in what I will call the ignorance is bliss category. They seem, to ha be, they seem to have a cheery disposition, right? If, if you were to look at their character traits and qualities, their personality, they are not very susceptible to negative emotion, okay? This just has to do with your makeup. Some people are not very susceptible to negative emotion. And I'm not saying they're dumb or anything like that, but they just kind of live in this ignorance is bliss category, Right? Where everything seems cheery. They kind of have a bright outlook on life. And they can just kind of go through life generally happy with the way things are. Now I want you to know that that is a personality disposition. That is a character quality that you don't get to pick for yourself. And if you live around a bunch of those people and you keep looking at them, you're going to think you're deficient. You're going to think there's something wrong with you. You're going to think you don't belong. But those aren't the only type of people that God made. I've been preaching through Ecclesiastes. What are some of his favorite phrases? Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Life is a chasing after the wind. Everything I find under the sun is meaningless. And I think God has given a different task to people with this disposition. 
They do not live in the ignorance is bliss category. They look at the world around them and they see the meaninglessness of it inherently. They wrestle with it. They struggle with it. It hurts them. It harms them. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure where to go. And they see that some of their fellow human beings are perfectly content to live in the meaningless world and they think the problem lies with them. But here's my theory. I think God gives that disposition to some, not because they're weak, but because they're strong. They can bear that heavy burden. They can bear that heavy load. And they have something to offer to this world that many who are in the ignorance is bliss category cannot offer the world. Not that there's anything wrong with those people. Not that there's anything deficient. But those who see the world as Kohelet sees it, those who see the world for what it is as a place full of meaninglessness actually have a unique contribution that they can make to the world. God gives them this disposition because they're strong, because they can carry the load, because they can bear the weight, the heavy, heavy weight. Not everyone can carry the ring to Mordor. Only Frodo could. Sam could help, yes, but not everyone could carry that ring. Boromir, looking really good, really strong. On the outside, everything that the world could offer. He wasn't strong enough to carry that ring. But Frodo could. Frodo could carry the ring. And I think some are given this disposition of susceptibility to negative emotion. Because God knows they're strong. And they can carry that heavy weight. They can carry that heavy load. And it's a burden, I'm not going to lie. But I think some are given that so that they can Help others who are struggling. Help others who are working through it. The most effective people I have seen to help somebody who's been going through depression or anxiety, through su suicidal ideation, the most effective people I've seen in those ministries and in those realms have gone through that deep, dark valley themselves. They know what it's like. They've been in that darkness. They've walked through that valley. And so... Those are the best things I can I can offer you with right now. When it comes to forgiveness and all of those things, I want to proclaim as loudly as possible that repentance and faith in Jesus Christ forgives all manner of sins, right? There's only one unforgivable sin that I find in the Bible that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But there's, there's something grave about trying to take God's prerogative from him. And I, I don't know what the end result of that is. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't tell us. Jesus says, which one of you can add an hour to your life? Rhetorically. What's his point? The span of your life is in God's hands, not yours. It's not to you to decide. It's in God's hands, not yours. And so, to try and end your life is to try and snatch God's sovereignty away from him. To try and take something away from him that rightfully belongs to him. It is, in a sense, a treason of the highest authority. It is as though you are climbing up on God's throne and trying to remove the crown from his head. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that that's an unforgivable sin to try and scare you or something like that. But that's a grave sin. And I don't know the ultimate answer. And I don't know the ultimate fate of somebody who seeks to take God's prerogative from him. So those are my thoughts on the topic. Thank you for letting me pray for you. Like I said, if any of those help you, feel free to adopt them. If any of those don't help you, feel free to throw them away. Okay? You don't have to embrace any of that if it doesn't help. 
Okay? But I will be praying for you. I appreciate your openness and you sharing a very difficult thing with us today. And I wish you the best. Okay? I wish you the best. 